Hello, my name is Eric Brainsberg. I'm CTO of Heimdall Data. Uh, in this video, we are going to go through creating an entire POC environment to demonstrate the functionality of Heimdall from scratch. This means every aspect of the configuration will be documented and can be followed along in order to create an identical environment within your own AWS account. The order of operations that we're going to do is going to optimize the actual time that it takes in order to set everything up. So we're going to start by doing some of the longer duration pieces that take to complete. And then while those are running, we will do other steps as well. So the first thing that we're going to do just as a pre-qualification is we're going to set up a security group that will be used. Now for this example, I'm just going to create an open security group that ensures that uh, we have everything open that we need to for this particular demo. This is obviously not best practice, but it does make everything a little bit simpler and easier to validate. Okay. Now that we have the security group, we can start creating the resources that take a long time to create because they will need the, res the security group attached to them. First, we're gonna go in, we're going to create database. And for our use case, we are going to be using SQL Server. Although you can create an Aurora cluster uh, for RDS, uh, RDS Aurora for uh, Postgres, MySQL, anything else, uh, depending on what your application is. But in this case, SQL Server, since we are going to be demonstrating read write split, we're going to want to create an enterprise edition server that allows you to create read replicas. So we're going to come in. SQL Server 1, I'm going to use the more typical SA admin user. I'm going to put in a password. I'm just going to use the default M6i extra large for the instance type. We're going to leave everything else the same, except we're going to set mirroring always on to off because we're going to create our own read replica that will act as the standby. We don't have any other resources to attach, so we're not going to worry about that at the moment. We're not going to worry about public access and we're going to come in and use our open group for availability zones. We want in general, you want to set up everything in to align in what availability zones you use with your applications. Since we don't have any other resources already created, we're just going to use US, US West 2A as our primary. We can put our reader in 2B for redundancy. And then we come on over. Everything else we're going to leave as a default. Now, while that is creating, we can come on over and create the next resource, which will be an ElastiCache for Redis instance. Now, the first step we want to do here is we're going to create a Heimdall Redis group. There's already one created. I'm just going to delete that one for the moment because we want to recreate it. I want to show you how. Create parameter group. Heimdall. Now, the reason why we want to create a parameter group is because we use a feature called key space notifications. That allows Redis to tell our proxy when a key has been created or removed, and we actually track them locally. This way, we know what data is actually in the Redis cache, and we don't have to ask it uh, when it's going to be a cache miss. We're also going to use Redis 7. So we're going to use Redis 7 as the basic uh, parameter group. We're going to come here and we're going to create it. I'm doll. We're look, going to look for the notify key space event. Let's actually edit that. 
and we're going to want the value AE. Okay, good. Now that we have that done, we can come over to Redis. I'm going to create the Redis cluster. Uh, the parameter group that we created was not a cluster mode enabled, so we're just going to stay with a disabled, and in general, that's what you want to use. We're going to use Heimdall. Uh, we can use the multi-AZ enabled. Great. We're going to come here. We're going to select the parameter group that we just created. In general, we would recommend using, say, the M6G larges as your default instance for production. Uh, they can be sized up if need be later. Since this is a test environment, I am simply going to use a T4G, and I'm going to leave it with exactly one replica. Now I'm going to choose the, my current availability zone and default VPC, and I want to specify placement. We had our primary database set in US West 2A, so I'm going to line my uh, cache, the primary cache, with 2A as well and I'm gonna do a replica in 2B. Next, we come into our security settings. The encryption at rest can be set, but is largely irrelevant because we don't write the data to the disk. Encryption in transit, if you're in a regulated industry, you definitely wanna put that, otherwise it's up to you. And if you enable encryption in transit, it also enables access control. We're gonna set the access control token. I'm just gonna show this. It's long one, and we're going to use our open security group again. We do not need the backups. I'm going to specify my maintenance window to be 7 a.m. UTC. Not going to worry about version upgrades, and everything else is optional. Next, we can review our settings and create. Okay, the next resource that we're gonna create, we're gonna go into our EC2. Uh, we're gonna create some instances. You can see that I've run through this already once before, but I'm going to launch an instance. We're going to be installing the NOP Commerce software package as our application that installs onto Windows. I'm going to come in, let's say, instance type. I don't want anything too small, but I don't need to make anything particularly expensive either. I'm just going to use a T3 large. I'm going to create a new key, create key pair. I'm going to select my open security group. From prior experience, I want to add a little bit more space. And we should be good to go to launch this. View all instances. Great. Next service that we're going to do is we're going to subscribe to the Heimdall solution. This also can sometimes take a little while. So I'm going to manage subscriptions, discover products, and search for Heimdall data. I'm going to use the Heimdall data proxy edition for ARM. And we're going to accept terms. And we now wait for the subscription to actually complete. So at this point, we have our RDS uh, SQL Server, the primary node in creation. We have our ElastiCache instance in creation. We have our Windows Server to act as the application server in creation. And we have the AWS subscription for Heimdall Data in process as well. Okay, now that we've uh, waited a little while, resetting and coming back, 
Uh, let's take a look at the resource of the resources that have been created. Uh, we have our Windows instance. We have our RDS instance is online as well. And we have our Elasticache instance. Now, the next thing we're gonna do though, is we're gonna go back to RDS. In order to have a read replica, we actually need to make a change to this SQL Server. This will allow us to add the replica. In order for this to work, we need to have a multi-AZ setup. Now, we can allow this uh, multi-AZ configuration to take uh, effect while we're doing other work. So, this is all good. Okay. Okay, so that's now in effect. But let us come on over and start working with our Windows install because that will take some time as well. We want to go in, connect. We want to get the password first. Oop. Upload, decrypt password, and we have this. I'm going to open up a remote desktop client. Okay. And we want to Google for NOP Commerce installation, installing one on Windows, technology and system requirements. There's some prerequisite software that we need to install. We're going to get the .NET, ASP.NET, and we're going to come in and get the base.NET. Install the Microsoft.NET SDK. Okay, had two installers going. Next download that we're going to want is Visual Studio. Come on over here and download the Community Edition. Start the installer. Now, this step will take a little while. So, next, we'll go back over to the Not Commerce installation and go to the download page. Package with source is what we want since we'll just start it through uh, Visual Studio. I already have an account set up. Open the file on this. Minimize new folder. And this also takes a little while to complete. 
Okay. We now have the decompressed code and visual visual studio and looks like it did not automatically install. So we'll just get that going again as well. So while this install is uh, taking a while, I am going to go off and start on the next step and then we will come back to our Windows install. So at this point, we have our Windows application server being prepped. We now want to start the Heimdall install. If we just go to launch instances, we're gonna come in, browse more AMIs. We're gonna go to the marketplace and search for Heimdall data, and we're gonna select our ARM, enterprise version, continue. It's now gonna populate various information, like what instance types. I'm going to start with an A1 large. Uh, the A1 instances are slower ARM-based instances. Uh, they are useful for uh, cheap prototyping and for testing. We're going to continue with the same key pair that we uh, used as a part of our Windows install. We're going to accept all the uh, security groups that are created and everything else. And we're going to launch our instance. You all instances are now going to come in. Okay. And the Heimdall console is online. Let's come back over here. The password will be the instance ID. Admin is the default user. And we're in. As noted, you can get support from a Heimdall as well from support at heimdalldata.com. And if you are going to use Heimdall in production, we recommend that customers contact Heimdall support to perform a, a configuration review to make sure that there are no subtle problems that are unexpected. Okay. Now, at this point, we can start our configuration. Now, there's actually one other piece that we're gonna do. If you do AWS detect, you're gonna see nothing happens. That's because we have not had attached an IAM role to the Heimdall instance to give it permissions to any AWS APIs. So we're gonna come in here, we're gonna set that up. Roles, there's no Heimdall role already. Create, EC2, next, and we're gonna start attaching policies. First is EC2 read only. Next, RDS read only. Last the cache read only. CloudWatch full access, the full access allowing rights so that we can create CloudWatch log groups. and Secrets Manager read-write. Uh, this is an optional piece that allows us to write our configurations into a secret as opposed to the disk, allowing us to safely and securely store anything in that configuration that may con be considered sensitive. Now I'm gonna come on over, name that Heimdall, create role. Now I go back to EC2 instances, security, modify IAM role, Heimdall, update IAM role. You can create the role before creating your instance and assign the role at initialization time as well. With that change, let's come back through to AWS detect. Now, nothing is showing as RDS cluster name here for now but we do see lots of cache. And the reason for that is that this is not an available instance at the moment. If we come back over to the RDS server, 
and look at the DB instances, it's in a status of modifying as, a, as opposed to available. Only available instances will show up in the dropdown list. So we're going to wait for this to complete before we continue any further. But what we can do is we can go back over to our Visual, Visual Studio installer. Looks like all installations are up to date. Good. Now we can get started here on the next step by coming in into the install source directory and start up Visual Studio with a Visual Studio project. The first time through, it does take a little bit of time once we have everything ready here and we can execute it with this run button. And again, this will take a little while before it actually starts everything up. Okay, next part is it's asking us to trust the certificate. We're just going to click through all that. Okay, so not commerce. At this point, we're going to have to have everything else configured and ready to go. But uh, all the tasks that take a long time have been completed on the Windows server. So we're just going to minimize that for the moment. We're going to come back over here. We can see that our SQL server is still in the modifying stage. And if we wait long enough, we can see now finally our SQL server has come online. It is now a multi AZ always on cluster. And at this point, we could, if we wanted to, add a read replica. We're, however, going to wait because we want to demonstrate that Heimdall is able to detect read replicas as they're being added as part of our demonstration. So we're going to leave it as is for now. We're going to come back over to the Heimdall console. We're going to go into the configuration wizard, do AWS detect, and now we can see our RDS clusters available and Heimdall as a cluster name for the uh, Redis is also available. I'm going to type in our passwords, set the default data database as master for now. We want to keep track cluster changes in place. We can see that it detected the TLS cache password. We're just going to click through all the defaults, submit. And if we did everything right, the test cache button works and test connection to the database also works. So Heimdall is now online. Okay, oh, time 30 seconds. Looking good. And if we check the logs, we don't see any obvious errors. We just have the API calls being logged. So with this in place, we can now just go to the dashboard so that we can monitor any activity. And we can come back over to our install of NopCommerce. So, and we want the create sample data so that it will actually populate it with a storefront. Create database if it does not exist. Server name, we're now going to put in the server name of Heimdall. Okay, we're gonna enter in all the various information. And what we're going to say, uh, the instance of SQL Server attempted does not support encryption. Great. So that is a configuration item that is in and is not specified by default. OK. We'll use our global use certificate. I'm going to note here that you can come in and do a let's encrypt cert wizard where you can follow the, the uh, various challenge types, and this will allow you to get a trusted certificate, and it's actually usually pretty easy to do.
but I'm going to skip that for the moment since all we need to do is ensure that that is enabled. We can then come back on over. We'll have to re-enter our passwords. Test one. Okay, and let's try again. And if we come here, assuming that traffic hits, we should see something show up here. It may take a moment. Okay, we got something. We saw that it tried to create the database. Okay, I've seen this occasionally happen. It uh, may be a timeout here, so let's just try one more time. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. You can see that a lot of queries are coming through. If you go to the analytics, we'll be able to immediately pull that up and you can see all the information, all the queries that are being used in order to build the uh, database for the application. Now this may take a few minutes. Okay. Now that we've done the initial uh, install execution of uh, NotCommerce, we can then execute again and it should start up. If it does not start up cleanly, simply clear the cache and then restart it again. Uh, just because there's some artifacts that uh, could get cached as part of the initialization sequence that are not normally changed and the cache can uh, uh, interfere with that. Under normal operation, it doesn't cause any problem though. Okay. And we have our NopCommerce application online. We can then browse through a little bit. And if we come over here, sorry, back here, dashboard, we can see the activity as we operate it. Okay, and we can look at all the data, everything that's going on. There's some fair number of updates that happen as part of the uh, normal operation. We can delete all the logs now that we're online and then browse through. Now, one interesting aspect about NopCommerce it does have a built-in cache already. So as a result of that, you end up not seeing much traffic when it's normally operating. If you want to disable that cache, however, so that you can really see how caching behaves, when an application does not have it, you just close out. Let's go back into our... Uh, Uh, code and if we look at app data app settings so presentation not web app data and if you come in here you will find the section cache config and we can set the default cache time to zero and short term cache to zero and from here we can file, save it. We can close that out and run our application again. And what we're gonna find is a very different behavior. You see an extremely high cache hit rate at this point. 
because it was written with the idea of I can just query again, and it's a very lightweight query. So it just queries it out of the cache, but instead it uh, is now coming out of the Heimdall cache. Okay. And if we simply go to computers, for example, you can see hundreds of queries a second just to render the computers tab. This really is an application that absolutely needs caching. Electronics, apparel. Okay, so we have all that going through. It's coming from the cache. So the caching is now demonstrated at this point. So I'm going to minimize this. Let's go over and look at the data sources. Okay, we have our SQL Server 1 listener. We've got all the configuration, but it also has the AWS RDS ARN. So this is the ARN for the cluster itself. What we're now going to want to do is try to demonstrate read write split and automated uh, configuration management. Okay, create write, read replica. We'll just use the default again. We'll use US West 2B to match what our uh, Elastic Hash replica is configured in. And everything else we should be able to leave by default. Now, Heimdall is still online and able to serve traffic through the primary while this process is uh, taking place. But we will, again, have to wait for all this to happen. Uh, be configured. And after a while, we're getting to the point where SQL Server 2 is almost completely online. If we come back over to the Heimdall console, oh look, uh, during the process it did give an error that the always on state was not found or inconsistent. That's normal, but after that, it found the new read-only server, and it's now online even though it does show that it's still in the modifying state. So there's there's one action that looks like dealing, okay, dealing with uh, enhanced monitoring. It's still trying to turn that on, but you can see that we're able to do the, the show that we have the read-only server online. Uh, I'm going to refresh so that we can look at the new configuration that's on the server. And you can see that it is pointing to server 2 as the read-only server. Yay! So with that, let us come on back over to our not commerce. Click on something. still online and let's pause this we can see that a bunch of traffic came in but you can see that the read-only server in purple actually received a bunch of the queries that were coming through at that time as the cache was getting populated now with the cache handling all this traffic that means that that is traffic not going to the read-only server so let's go in, we're going to go to the rules, and we're going to disable this reader eligible rule. That, excuse me, we're not going to disable that one, we're going to disable the cache rule. So now instead of going to the cache, most of those reads should go to the reader. And we can come on over here, 
And let's take a look at this. Digital downloads. You can see almost everything is going to the read-only server now. So the read-only server is handling the load. The read-write server is not. Very little traffic is going to the read-write server. And we have now demonstrated read-write split successfully. Okay, so those are the two uh, major uh, features that we want to demonstrate with SQL Server. Uh, and both have been completely uh, uh, successful. We can turn that back on and we can see dashboard as soon as we do some more traffic again, the cache hit ratio goes back up again and much of the traffic that would have gone to the reader is now consumed by the cache engine instead. And with that, I would like to thank you for uh, following through on uh, with me on all this. Uh, hopefully, you've been able to glean some uh, something out of this. And if you were trying to follow along, you've been able to get to this point where you have an online operational example of uh, uh, Heimdall with a working application. Thank you. Bye.